if you would, 2 Corinthians. Actually, uh, I pastor a church in Rensselaer. Uh, it be 30 years in October. And uh, pastored a church in Lowell. I got green lights. I feel like I'm packing. I feel good. So I pastor a church in Lowell. These go higher. For 20 years, last week was uh, our 20th year. So I've been doing two churches for 20 years. I'm, I'm kind of used to our services. We kind of keep a time schedule. So I'm already going to bed. I don't know about you folks. But, but uh, I built a log house is what I did. Okay, it's just in home, not in Colorado. I built a log house, cut the trees, peeled the bark, and uh, did everything on that. That's our dream home. So if you would, 2 Corinthians, uh, Brother Walker needs an answer to prayer. Usually when you uh, get a new church, start a new church, you're always worried about piano players. I'm sure he's got a big problem with that. <laughs> Working on that one, yeah. When I was going to pastor in Rensselaer, my wife said, I'm not playing the piano. I said, it's okay, it's okay. But I knew she'd be a person that feels a need and she's playing the piano. <laughs> So, uh, 2 Corinthians. I just hope this is a blessing to you. Am I uh, loud enough now? Need that? Need your NIV? <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so, I'm, a, I'm a, I guess an answer to prayer, part of an answer to prayer that William Tyndale told a couple of priests years ago that he said, uh, someday a common plowboy is going to know more Bible than a Roman priest. Now, knowing more Bible than a Roman priest isn't saying much, but still, uh, just a common plowboy, uh, farmed up there, grew up there, been in Indiana, northwest Indiana all my life, except for two and a half years in Colorado. And my lovely wife grew up in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. And so, in 2 Corinthians, I want to give you three basic attitudes of the ministry. Okay, three basic attitudes in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Uh, if you've uh, read through Paul's writings, uh, this is uh, this, the theme of this letter in ministry. And there's two basic aspects to the ministry. One is your primary aspect, and one is your secondary aspect. And everybody usually gets them backwards as we get the first and second commandment backwards. And in chapter 4, verse 1, it says, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. Okay, what ministry? If you go backwards two verses, because you see the word therefore, you'll see it is in verse 17 and 18, somebody looking in a Bible personally. Verse uh, 17, the Lord is that spirit, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, but we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the spirit of the Lord. And now if that's, if that's a good statement, that that's personal Bible study, if you go to the verse after it, you'll see that a person renounces the hidden things of dishonesty, not, hand, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully. Okay, that's your primary ministry. Everyone who's born again is your primary ministry. Your most important ministry is your personal Bible study, your personal walk with God. The second aspect is in chapter 5, verse 18. This is what people commonly call the ministry. If you get these cattywampus, you'll know somebody in the second aspect who have not been doing the first aspect, and then they'll fall by the wayside. Chapter 5, verse 18. And all things are of God, who have reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. The second aspect is really trying to get people to obey the first aspect. Okay, starting with salvation and then Bible study and so forth and so on. Chapter 6, verse 3, it says, Give no offense in anything that the ministry be not blamed. Okay, so uh, 2 Corinthians focuses on the ministry. Ezra and Nehemiah are some practical instructions when you're trying to fulfill a task for God. Ezra and Nehemiah, you'll find some internal struggles, some external troubles. You'll find some political struggles. And then Moses portrays a pastor because he was a shepherd of a church in the wilderness. 
Okay, so those are some practical things. But the two basic aspects of the ministry is your primer, primary inner ministry of your walk with God is your through personal Bible study. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. That's number one. Number two is your secondary is your outward ministry of seeking others to fulfill the primary ministry. That's the second aspect. That's loving thy neighbor as thyself. Jesus died on a cross first primarily for God. Amen. Amen. Secondarily for man. Right. He fulfilled God's holiness and justice. That was his primary aspect of going to the cross. His secondary aspect is his love for you and I. Okay, so that's the two basic aspects. I'll work on three basic attitudes that you have towards a biblical ministry. You see, you can have a right, any parent knows that you can have his child do the right action but have the wrong attitude, and you're going to say, you need an attitude adjustment. Amen. Okay, now, if our attitude is right and the action is wrong, God can work on our attitude to get the action right. If our action is wrong and our attitude is wrong, then there's, no, there's all loss. If our attitude is wrong and our, action, our attitude is right, our action's wrong, then God can adjust us because we have an attitude that God can work with. Now, there's a subtle danger, and we've all heard of this, how many... Uh, preachers, or how many people in the ministry fall out of the ministry, go into some gross sin or whatnot. And the reason why that happens is basically for two basic reasons. Is One is Satanists are praying harder than we do. Because Satanists, I remember hearing of a Satan years ago that she's been, they've been praying for 3,000 preachers to fall that year, and they got their answers to prayer. Okay, so they're praying harder, but, second, but primarily is that we get too busy in the ministry and we're not spoke, focusing our walk with God. Now, a lot of times people ask me, how do I pastor two churches? Well, it's country folks, small town people, and if they cut their finger, I tell them, don't call me. They live their lives, I live my lives, and it's really a wonderful situation, <laughs> to be quite honest with you. And I, you know, you're going to have to pray for me tomorrow because I am not used to city folk. <laughs> city slickers just don't cut it for me. I'm just not used to that. 10,000 is a big city, a metropolis for me. Okay, but, uh, you know, I just really feel totally unqualified to be speaking to you folks. That's for sure, being a country boy. Okay, but even at that, I want to give you three basic attitudes of the ministry. And the first thing, the primary one, is you have sincerity in doctrine. Be sincere in your doctrine. If you're in a 2 Corinthians still, look in chapter 1, verse 12. Sincerity in doctrine. Remember that <clears throat> this uh, letter is about the ministry, and you're going to discover in the ministry that most people in the ministry are not sincere. Verse 12 of chapter 1, For our rejoicing is this, the testament of our conscience, that in simplicity and godly sincerity. Now, when he puts the adjective in front of sincerity, that implies there's a fake sincerity. That's the Jehovah Witnesses that knock on your door. <laughs> I haven't met one that was sincere yet. How do I know? By their reaction. Godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God, we have had our conversation of world and more abundantly to you word. Okay, chapter 2, verse 17. Any Bible believer knows that this verse changed in every new Bible. <coughs> okay, in chapter 2, uh, verse 17. For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God in a sight of God speak we in Christ. Sincerity in our doctrine. Paul told Timothy, 1 Timothy 4, verse 16, Take heed unto thyself and unto thy doctrine. Continue in this, continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. That's not a salvation of the soul, because in chapter 4, verse 1, talks about in the latter days many are going to depart from the faith and so forth. There's going to be seducing spirits. It's being saved from deception. And what do you do? You got to take heed to yourself, your walk with God, and to your doctrine. 
Titus 2, verse 6, it says, Young men, likewise, exhort to be sober-minded. In doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity. Sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that's of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. Doctrine that is sound is not contradictory. Amen. Heresy always contradicts himself. When you're talking to somebody, let them talk. They don't have an ever ready battery because they got heresy. They'll blow the, all their battery shot in five minutes or less. And that's why heresy always is. It's always contradictory. And what you do is you just point out the contradiction. You don't have to read all the stuff what people do. You just let them talk. Okay? And they'll talk themselves in a corner. And then when they're in a corner, you just point that out to them. Okay? And so... Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. Why did God give us a Bible? We obviously know, Bible believers know, God gave us a Bible, the complete revelation of the Bible, Genesis to Revelation, for doctrine. Okay, doctrine is an absolute truth of God. Now, anybody can teach the Bible from cover to cover, instructionally, practically, spiritually, motivationally, devotionally. Anybody can do that from Genesis to Revelation. But doctrinally, you must rightly divide the scriptures according to the proper covenants. Anybody that's got a Bible sees there's two basic covenants. And then you throw in the Edenic and the Adam and all these others, the seven of them. And you run those covenants. And that you got to keep your doctrine sound within those covenants. Sincerity is an attitude that's closely interwoven with honesty. They're attitudes. Okay, and we already read 2 Corinthians 4, 2, where dishonesty was mentioned. And then, remember in the parable of the sower and the seed in Luke chapter 8, verse 15, the fourth believer there had a good and honest heart. A good and honest heart. Okay, and so we want to be sincere in our doctrine. Now, how do you know if you're sincere or honest in your doctrine? How do I know the Jehovah Witnesses that come to my house whenever I witness to them, or the Mormon, the little Mormon boys? They, I mean, I don't, they must drink some youth medicine because these kids look like they're 20, but they've got elder on their badge. I never could figure that out. And, uh, and then they always ask them what tribe they come from. And they always say they come from Ephraim, and I laugh at them. I say, tell me you're a blonde-haired, blue-eyed kid, and you're a Jew. You've got to be kidding somebody else. And I run them to Isaiah 7, verse 8, where it says, In three score and five years, Ephraim shall not be a people. Can you imagine they picked one of the 12 tribes? They picked one of the 12 that's gone. <laughs> and then I run them to Isaiah, Jeremiah, where 100 years later it says, Ephraim is not a people. I said, Here, you guys picked the wrong one. It's not even in the New Testament. Ephraim is only mentioned once in the New Testament. It's a city, it's a town. And then my favorite is I give him the third one because three strikes are out. I take him to Hosea 7, verse 8, and it says, Ephraim is a cake not turned. And I look at him and smile. I said, you know what that is? And they said, no. I said, that means you're half-baked. <laughs> oh, man, that's, that book is loaded. The Bible's loaded. It's, a com it's got common sayings all through there. When you see the common sayings, that's an open door to say something to somebody. Okay, and so you see them come and say, how do you know people are sincere? It's a two-step process. Sincere people will admit an error. They will admit an error, a weakness, a sin, a fault, a falsehood, an ignorance. They'll admit it, a weakness. A sincere person will say, man, I just don't know. There is no shame when somebody asks you a question, you just look at them and say, well, I don't know the answer. But you give me seven days and we'll see if God gives us an answer. You might be surprised what you find in seven days. Now, they may be running off, but at least your sincerity has manifested itself. Amen. Sincerity admits when we're wrong. Now, I know the typical fundamentalist apology. It goes something like this. I know you misunderstood me because you're not real smart. You misunderstood what I was saying to you, and so I'm asking you to forgive me because you're stupid. Instead of saying, I was wrong. 
You know, that's a wonderful phrase that husbands need to learn to say. I was wrong. Please forgive me. No excuses. No nothing. Sincerity. I mean, if you go to King David in Psalm 32 and Psalm 51, you'll see that he acknowledges his sin. His sin against God. Now, other guys acknowledge their sin, but it was uh, more like they got caught rather than of who they are. One thing is you admit your error. The second thing is you acknowledge the truth. That's all that it is. It's very simple. Two-step process. You admit your error, you acknowledge your truth. Why? Is because your conscience is alert. You know, I went through, you know, I went to two years to a Plymouth Brethren College where my, my wife, that's the only thing, good thing I got out of that place, <laughs> was my wife. Then we went to, forgive me, please forgive me, I went to Hiles Anderson for three years. And I was just as green as a gourd. Come out, got saved out of Dutch Reform, the Bible Church. I thank God that God predestinated me not to be a Calvinist, and so I'm happy about that. And uh, I'm I'm happy that I reject Arminians because of my free will too of uh, that one. So we'll cover all our bases and all that stuff. But uh, I went to Hiles Anderson, and then I got out of school, got into the work in Colorado where the brother mentioned, and got in the street and got dealing with people, and they throw this Acts 2:38 at me. I didn't know what that was. Not a clue. Not a clue what that was. And I'm on the street dealing with this, with people knocking on doors out there, and, I, and on my way home, the Lord would be saying, they got you, didn't they? They got you. They got you. Yeah, but I weaseled out of it, didn't I? Yeah, yeah. Well, I know they're not right. I know what's not right, but I don't know what is right. And after being out there for a couple years, somebody gave me a... a a cassette tape of a guy named Ruckman. And I thought, wow, that's different. And uh, so I started listening to that for a while. I said, man, that is what I've been looking for. The first commentary I read of his was Hebrews. Loved it. Oh, I couldn't believe it. I can answer Hebrews 3 now and Hebrews 6 now and Hebrews 10 now without changing a word in the Bible, without you know, going to Greek or Hebrew or Latin or French or whatever they go to. It was such a blessing to learn doctrine. I mean, such a blessing. Sincerity in doctrine. A Bible believer will change his beliefs to match the Bible. A Bible critic will change the Bible to match his beliefs. And that's the two basic differences. You know, repentance in 2 Timothy 2.25 is simply acknowledging the truth. And that's what godliness is. A lot of times we think godliness is, you know, somebody looking real nice, you know, the Pope and all that stuff. All godliness is which is after godliness is acknowledging the truth. The truth is Jesus Christ is a Savior. I'm a worthless bum, so I'm going to acknowledge that. I repent toward Him. I mean, it's just like that. And you see, the Lord just opens these things up. And if you look at some of the men in the Bible, can you imagine being the Apostle Peter? Now, my life grew up Dutch Reform, then Bible Church Movement, uh, and then uh, Grace College or Plymouth Brethren, and then the, the Fundies, the Hiles Anderson, the Fundamentalists, Sword of the Lord, all that stuff. And then I saw these Bible believers. Amen. I saw this AV611 boat going along. Man, I jumped on that boat. And man, I was loving that boat. And there were some stinking guys riding this boat and said, this boat's got some water in it. It's got some leaks. And I said, are you serious? I'd go over and look at the leak, take a towel, wipe it up. I said, ain't no leak, you dirty bum. You pull, you pull the water out of the ocean into the boat. If you don't want to believe the book, go someplace else. But though all those steps, and I'm sure you got a different pattern. Why? Sincerity. Sincere people will follow this path. Okay, if you look at the Apostle Peter, how did, he, how did he live? The Apostle Peter grew up, born and raised in the Judaistic faith. Then here comes John the Baptist. You got a transition in there. 
And then he's the apostle of Jesus for three and a half years. And then you get to Acts 2, and then to Acts 8, and then to Acts 10. And I'll bet you Peter was scratching his time and time, his head time and time again. And finally they had a meeting in Acts 15 and got it figured out. But can you imagine all those changes he went through, all those transitions, and everyone was right? What led him down that? His sincerity. He was sincere in his doctrine. Proof of his sincerity, when Jesus was washing their feet, he came to Peter. He said, Peter said, you ain't washing my feet. And Jesus said, well, if I'm not going to wash your feet, not one of mine. He said, well, then in that case, wash me from head to foot. Now, if that's not a 180, I don't know what is. Amen. That's what a sincere man will do. Now, there are some tough doctrines. You may not do a 180 immediately. You might do a 10, 10 degree, maybe a 15 degree, maybe a 30 degree. And one, eventually you get to be a 180 because you're sincerity. A sincere person will accept the unpopular truths of the Bible. In John chapter 6, the only chapter 6, verse 66 in the New Testament, after Jesus talked about eating his flesh and drinking his blood, he looked at the apostles, you guys take it off too? Peter said, Pete said, where are we going to go? You got the words of eternal life. He accepted unpopular truths. That's what a sincere person will do. A sincere person will adjust his thinking to match the Bible. Sincerity and doctrine, that's the first one, the first attitude. The second one is humility of service. Now, being a country boy, this one really applies in small towns, especially humility of service where you're actually working with people. Acts chapter 20, verse 19, Paul said to the uh, people of Ephesus when he was going through there, he said, serving the Lord with all humility of mind. Humility is an attitude, just like sincerity is an attitude, just like honesty is an attitude. You ever see somebody try to portray humility? Well, I'm proud of my humility, and the way I just showed it. Humility is an attitude, okay? And that's when you get down and get dirty and work with people. My sister's a missionary in China. It takes two years on the average for a person to receive the gospel. That don't work in America. America's too impatient. I've learned, you know, country folk. Uh, my dad, you know, we, you know, I've raised on a farm, you know, dad buy a tractor or whatnot. He never did this dickering back and forth. He'd just say to the guy, give me your best price, and the guy would give him the best price. And then if the guy said I'd go lower, then dad said, you lied to me. You didn't give me your best price first time. I'm going elsewhere. But he was talking to one of the tractor salesmen. And he said, how many trips do you have to take to the farm to sell a tractor? He said, on the average, five. He said, okay. He said, to the good farmers, four to sell the tractor, one to collect the money. To the poor farmers, one to sell the tractor, four to collect the money. And the thing is, is quick to believe, quick to leave. Slow to believe, slow to leave. That's just a general rule. And when you develop a relationship with people, especially country folk. Now, I know the city is coming to the country folk fast because of the cell phones. Okay, but you got to humbly serve people and work with them and work on an engine, and change an engine with somebody, and mow their lawn, and build things for them, and work with them. Humbly serve people. Humility of mind. Jesus said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, Paul said. It's humi humi uh, humility of mind and attitude of serving others. Romans 12, verse 10, be kindly affectionate one to another, in, uh, in brotherly love, in honor, preferring one another. There is a reward in serving the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, you proclaim the light first, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So we let our light shine first. We tell them about the Lord Jesus Christ. 
and then let them sit back and watch you and work for them and do some work for them. I mean, if you got a wedding, help clean it up. Pick things up around the church. Be the worker in the church. Be the builder in the church. I mean, no matter the size of church, when I went to Rensselaer, man, a little podunk place, I did everything. Learn how to build construction. That's probably where I learned how to build a log house. No, that was a two-day class I took. I mean, I mean, you just can't working with people, working with your hands. You know, a lot of preachers, they don't work with their hands, and their hands are as smooth as a baby behind. And when they shake some man's hand, they can tell it. You know, I'd go to the prisons to see this guy, and the guy would look at my fingers. He said, you're a working man. you got some grease on your fingernails. I said, it might be a booger. I don't know about that, but i got something underneath there. But the thing is, is we got to humbly serve people. you got to recognize that people will react. You ever try to free an animal from a trap? You ever try to help a harmed animal and how that animal reacts to you? It lashes at you. And that's what those sinners do on the street. They're going to lash out at you. Why? We're trying to give them freedom. They're stuck in a cage. Now, once they get outside the cage, just like any chicken, they're going to run around the cage trying to get back and in. Run around and around and around and around. And you see, you ever you see somebody, you ever wake up somebody when they're asleep and they're slow people don't wake up, man, they get up and grouches all get out? Yeah, that's, what's, that's what we're doing. We try to witness people on the street. Okay, and so humility of service. The third thing is in he, Matthew chapter 11, if you want to look at that one, this one is meekness in proclamation. Now, meekness is an attitude. Okay, and when I say meekness, most people my age thinks of Mr. Rogers. Okay, uh, that is not a good example of meekness. Remember the meekest man that God told to write the first five books of the Bible was a man that could bellow out his voice for two to three million people to hear him. Okay, but meekness and proclamation. Jesus Christ said, Come unto me, all ye labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn of me, for I am meek and lowliness in heart. It's an attitude. Meekness is an attitude. Okay, where Paul, when he described Jesus in 2 Corinthians 10, verse 1, he talked about the meekness and gentleness of Christ. The meekness and gentleness of Christ. And how we do display that is that we give a simple message. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, he says, Seeing we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. A good motto is never use a big word when a small word will do. Okay? And the thing is, is a lot of times... People as preachers, teachers, professors, professors, they want you to walk out impressed with them. But a Bible believer wants them to walk out imparted with truth, impressed with the Word. When I was down at Purdue one time, this kid was just rambling, my, talking my ear off. He went for about an hour, just oh, nothing, 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 nothing. And after an hour, you know, I listened to him, and I'd interject here and there and there. After an hour, I just said, hey, you know, you'd make a good college professor. He said, really? Why do you say that? I said, you can talk for an hour and not say anything. <laughs> and, you know, the kid laughed, and he said, you know, I've been told that before. <laughs> I said, oh. you know, I don't get it. Okay, but 2 Corinthians 11, verse 6, Paul said, though rude in speech, not in knowledge. You know, when you give out the gospel from an intellectual viewpoint, you've wasted your time. Why? 1 Corinthians chapter 1 says that if you proclaim the gospel with the wisdom of words, you make the cross of none effect. And when the birdies come in and take the seed is when we don't give it forth in an understanding, very simple, plain viewpoint, 
When the person doesn't understand, as soon as they walk away, here comes a bird of the air and takes the seed right out of their heart, Matthew 13, 19. We used to have a truck stop ministry where I'd go to the local truck stop. When I only had one church, I'd go down there. And, you know, it was just a little um, TV room. You know, two guys show up, maybe six guys, whatever. Uh, I think I had a big, big one of 11 one time. But it was just truckers come in there. I'd usually let them, you know, ask any question they want. I'd shoot from the hip and go that way. And if they didn't have any question, I'd go with the story of the Ethiopian eunuch. It's a wonderful story. You can hit anything and everything. Uh, you can hit salvation. You can hit study of scripture. You can play dumb. If they get an NIV, read verse 37. Before you read verse 37, say, now this is the most important verse in the entire passage. And man, it would be wicked to take this out of here. And I'd read the verse and watch the NIV guys go like this, and they look like this, and they go like this, and they look like this. And they'd raise their hand. You say, I think I got a misprint. I said, that's terrible. And I say, would you try this verse? And they looked at another misprint. And I'd throw, I'd throw another one at them. And they'd send another misprint. So I'd give them three misprints, three gone. And by then, they're upset. Not with me, though. Because somebody sold them a map where Interstate 40 was removed. And it messes you up. And then, by then, they'd be, we'd be trading Bibles, so I'd, I'd stack up my NIVs and give them a good old Bible. But I don't know how many times I heard them truckers say, I learned more Bible in these 40 minutes than I have in my entire life. And the reason why is I just talk like a farm kid. I just talk straight and plain. One of them guys one time was really upset with me, and we got done. And he was going to insult me. And he said, I want to tell you something. And I can see it coming. He said, you were 50% negative. And I smiled. I said, well, thanks. Well, he thought, what an idiot. Let me repeat this. I said, you were 50% negative. And I said, thank you. Isn't that a good balance? He said, no, I want to make sure you got this. You were 50% negative this morning. And I said, thank you again. You are a truck driver, right? You got a battery in your truck, right? Does it have a positive post and a negative post? Is that not 50%? Praise God. He walked out the door and said, what a nutcase I got here. You know? Why? Talk straight and plain with people. I would rather to sit there and look dumb than to open my mouth and prove I am dumb. The Lord wants us to talk straight and plain to people. When my grandfather died, he got saved three years before his death. He was raised in a Dutch reform. My uncle, the Dutch reform Domini, gave the service. I was, I was amazed he mentioned the gospel. I was amazed that he mentioned it. I was surprised. I was shocked that he mentioned it. But you know, the way he mentioned it was so high up here, that only saved people could get it. Right. And you know, as a, as, as a born-again Bible believer, I could go to a Catholic church and hear the gospel. You go to Methodist and hear something, but it's just so way up here that it all just blows over their head. Why? It's because they're given the cross of Christ through the wisdom of words. A better rendering is the Greek says this, the Hebrew says this, the scholarship says this, and everything goes out the door when we don't use plain English. I mean, we got King James all around us. And I point it out to people. You go to Walmart, oh, don't go to Walmart, because Mark, that's a King James only word. Don't go to the post office, because that's a King James only word. And certainly don't start your engine because you only find that in a King James Bible. And don't buy stuff at the store because that's a King James only word. And don't get merchandise because you only find that in a King James Bible. I mean, this book is so out of date, you go to the bank teller, she counts the money for you. But the teller, that's only King James word. I mean, we can go on and on that this book is all around us that people don't see it. Amen. They're just blinded to it. Meekness and proclamation. We got to understand a lot of times when we don't give something, if we get talking spiritual to people, that don't work. 
They don't understand that. You know, where our church talk is different than out there in the street. They don't understand that. You know, when King David was out there, in, on a, when he was running from King Saul, he's out there looking, thinking on the battlefield. He's thinking, he's thinking, boy, I wish I could have some water from that one well. And three of those soldiers went into enemy, enemy territory and got that water and brought it back. What did J David do with it? Poured it on the ground. Now, if those guys did not know the Bible truth that he was doing, they would have been greatly insulted and misunderstood what he did. They would have gotten mad and walked away. Now, if they would have done the right thing, a lot of times people get mad and walk away. Why don't they come and ask the person Amen. that confused them? It's because they're not sincere. If those men, if those men would have reacted to David right there, I can't believe you insulted us right now. And then David told him the truth. This, uh, my, my men, he said, this is a drink offering. I just poured that out to God. I didn't insult you. I honored you. And a lot of those Bible doctrines that people are taking as insult, they don't realize that these, these things are for their honor. But they don't get it. And so we got to talk straight and plain to them. Find out what their background is and use their terminology or their profession. Okay, whatever it is. You see, the Bible says we should have the attitude of a child in malice be children, but in understanding be men. And then he says in 1 Peter 2, he says, as newborn babies desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. I've noticed two things about wicked men, either in jail or on the street, that they respect two things. Innocence and a sense of humor. To be able to laugh about things. Ask innocent questions to expose their heresies, hypocrisies, and inconsistencies. I was down at Purdue one time and they had a gay fest going on. I was walking down to the corner where I was going to stand, had a Bible uh, sign with me, had some tracks, and this kid's walking beside me. We're walking down the same direction. I offered him a gospel track, and he said, uh, No, thank you. I said, Well, I'd like to give this to you. He said, Well, I just came from uh, you know, the gay fest. I said, Oh, you're gay? You're happy? I'm happy too. This will make you happier. <laughs> Amen. He said, No, you don't understand. I said, What I don't understand? The dictionary says gay means happy. This will really make you happy about the Lord Jesus Christ. And I kept doing that and kept doing that. You know what? He never corrected my thinking. Because if he would have came out and said what he thinks it meant, his conscience would have said, Gotcha. And so innocence got him. It got him. So innocence and a sense of humor. Laugh Amen. with your mockers. When they have a sign right beside you, one kid was right beside me, I'm with stupid, they arrow pointed me. Yeah. That's funny. I thought it was funny. <laughs> and he stood there, and he had to listen to me for quite a while. <laughs> and when he turned his head, I'd sneak around this way, like this, and then he'd see, and then he'd go back in this way. And then I'd watch it, I'd wait for him to turn his head, and then I'd slide down this way. <laughs> and then he'd walk closer, right beside. That's funny. I mean, Jan and I was just listening to Mike Pearl, and he's talking about the Lord is anointed with the oil of If they don't see our joy, why would they want what we have? Laugh at them. I had one girl said, man, I just walked up by a bunch of nuts. And I said, yeah, at least I'm screwed to the right bolt. Just laugh at them. I mean, they're, most of them are heading to hell anyway. They've got to have something to laugh now. Because they ain't going to be laughing in eternity. Now, the, meekly proclaim the truth. Now, obviously, boldly, Acts 4, 31, boldly we proclaim the message on the street. But when somebody comes up to you personally and walk, uh, talks to you, you've got to shift your attitude from a lion to a lamb. That quick. Amen. Second Timothy chapter two. Second Timothy chapter two. One time a girl came out of this bar 
our buddies were in the bar. I had my big banner, Jesus uh, hanging on the cross, that one right over there, just like that one. And she said, my friends are in the bar over there. And I waved at them. And he said, we really can't enjoy ourselves when you're standing here. We're asking if you'd move down. I said, no, I like it right here. <laughs> and we talked for a little while, and then she said, well, we, we're just asking, would you kind of move down a little bit further? I said, no, I'm real comfortable right here. I like it right here. I think I talked to her for a little while. Well, you know, I'm young. I want to have a, you know, a good time, you know, young college. I said, yeah, I hope you don't get a disease. I hope I don't. Yeah, you got to wake up. Think about that. You know, my, my beloved wife, she likes to stand in front of the bar and just pass out tracks, and I'm on the other side. Most of the time, those guys avoid the old guy. And they'll talk to her. I mean, the last time there was there, one guy took a big black eye for her. I walked over to her. He said, I took one for Jesus. He had a big, oh man, he had a, I was all red. I found out the rest of the story. He was calling a guy a name. He was trying to defend my wife. He's called his guy a name. Then his guy popped him. I said, well, I don't really think you took it for Jesus, but even at that, you know, we'll let you slide. <laughs> but uh, when they come and talk to you personally, you got to shift from a lion to a lamb. Amen. You say, how many times? 99 times out of 100. Probably. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 24, And the servant of the Lord must not strive. This is personal work, talking to somebody. But be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. That's the evolutionary theory. It opposes itself. It's non-scientific. We give a track out. The religion of evolution. They hate that. Oh, they hate that. And I quote three, four scientists stating that the evolutionary theory is a theory not based on fact, but on faith. Right from them. They say it's no different than creation, but we choose to reject creation. And it's their teaching in meekness, instructing those that oppose himself, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. There it is, right there. Meekly proclaim the truth privately. <clears throat> now, insecure men will gloat their perceived image of manhood and toughness. They'll argue to prove a point just to display their self-righteousness. They'll argue to prove their point just to display their intelligence. And Gentiles, we have a problem with manipulating people through fear to get a reaction that we want. We lord it over them. And all the Lord did in John 3 and in John 4 is he just presented a truth and let them deal with it. That's all that he did. And Nicodemus is a perfect example of a sincere man. You'll find him three times in the Gospel according to John. Okay, a sincere man in, Gen in John 3 will quietly consider. Remember, he came to Jesus at night. And then in John 7, the same man is now trying to defend the Lord Jesus. He will calmly consider. He will really consider what's going on. And then in John 19, he's helping Joseph of Arimathea. He came out. He accepted the truth by John. That's what a sincere man will do. He'll quietly come along most of the time, and then he'll accept the truth. And the thing is, a lot of times we're not patient enough with people to give them that liberty. Give people the liberty. I mean, God gave me the liberty, too. I'm, I mean, I got saved a nine-year-old kid, you know, and pff, produce any fruit for God. Pff, yeah, right. Nothing. I was a seed corn in a grain bin for years and years. I was a seed corn. I was seed. Well, you didn't see any fruit. You don't see fruit until you take that seed and put it in the ground. 
And then you get a little heat, you get a little moisture, and the shoot points out due north towards heaven, and then the, the body comes up. You see, a lot of people, they, they, in the ministry so much, people are always looking at this outward stuff. I mean, if you're going to plant a seed of a sequoia tree, don't expect it to sprout for a long time. And corn takes, corn now at this time of the year when it's cold like this, it'll rot in the ground. And it's still a seed. It's still a seed. So the thing is, is secure leaders will use their authority and knowledge for the benefit of others. J James chapter 3. James chapter 3, verse 13. Who is a wise man endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. Then verse 14, 15, and 16, that's the average college campus. And then verse 17, but the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated. How about that one? Do people feel comfortable to walk up to you and ask a dumb question? It's not a dumb question. If it's a sincere question, it's a good question. Easy being treated, not belittling them, not condescending toward them, not showing off my vast wisdom. It's just a simple response. This is what I understand to be true, and I'm going to pray that you get the same understanding as long as it agrees with Scripture. And guess what happens when they get the understanding? That's when inspiration takes place. If you limit the word inspiration to the Bible definition rather than what the scholars are saying. Inspiration is always present tense. It's when the Spirit of God illuminates your mind that you might understand the Scriptures and you walk away and say, that made sense. Nehemiah 8, verse 8. That was a three-point outline. They gave the sense. That's the pattern for public preaching. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, we ought to be able to give an answer. Simply an answer. I didn't finish reading James 3, 17. Full of mercy and good fruit, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Hypocrisy speaks against itself. A secure leader will desire to uplift the broken and weak. Where in Galatians chapter 6, that we bear the burdens of another. In Galatians chapter 6, it talks about a brother overtaken in a fault. And he says, If a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. Why? That could be me. That could be me. Considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Allow people the liberty to walk with God of their own conscience. And when it makes sense to the hearer, that's where you hit the point. When I hear somebody say, now that made sense. Yeah. Boy, that's exciting. That's one, of the, that's one of the most exciting things to hear when their eyes light up and they see it. I got it. And that's where the Spirit's working. And there ain't nothing better than that. Sincerely proclaim the truths of God to convince the humble and condemn the proud. Right. Your innocence and your sense of humor will condemn that proud man because the truth is a very simple knife that you don't have to hack at him. You know, that sharp two-edged sword, you can just push it in real slow and kind of gently push it in and smile as it's going in and watch it do its work. That book's good. You know, you don't have to yell it. You don't have to scream it to that individual because that's, that sharp two-edged sword, man, I know that thing pierced me so many times. And when I finally found that sharp two-edged sword, I found what I was looking for. Okay, let's pray. Lord, I do pray you'd help us understand these three basic attitudes, sincerity in doctrine, humility in service, and a meekness in proclamation. Yes, Lord, we do ask for boldness.
Obviously me, a little introvert country boy. Desperately need your boldness. But Lord, I do pray that when individuals do talk to us, that we can give them a simple answer that they might understand, that it might make sense to them. And Lord, I pray you'd help us to impart truth to others, that it might be a blessing when they can learn to develop their personal walk with thee, to love you with all their heart, with all their soul, with all their mind. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Okay, brother.